Welcome everybody. This is She Got Faith, Father of Healing. She Got Faith, and we're back for another Sunday. This will be a Grief Beyond Death episode. So for those of you who don't know, Grief Beyond Death is where we talk about grieving things that do not have to do with death and dying. So I bring on guests and we have some subjects that we kind of discuss and just things that we kind of look forward to because in this society, we do not address our feelings, our emotions. We don't address our issues as much as we should. And so we're here trying to create a safe place to be able to be comfortable with what you're going through. So today I have a very, very special guest, my best friend of 14 years. <laughs> we call each other twin. So she is going to be our guest for today, and I'm going to let her introduce herself. All right. So my name is not Twin. <laughs> um, it's Renisha, but you'll probably be referred to as Twin during this, um, which is fine. You can call me out before. It doesn't really matter to me. Um, but I am a sexual educator by trade, because that is what I do. Um, but by education, I am technically a um, so actually I got into work work in sexual reproductive health rights and justice. Um, that is something that is very hard that I uh, so I was predominant middle and high schoolers, but sexual health. I also teach classes around emotional intelligence and emotional regulation for the younger students. I can do it with other students as well. Um, and it's something that we do discuss with our younger students. We try to work that in, especially because of the populations that we serve. They definitely see a lot of violence, a lot of death. Uh, it's not something that any child that age should have to deal with, but we definitely want to make sure that we give them the tools to deal with it the best way that they can. Yeah. So as you can see, we're both very active in the community. So she's a public health professional by trade, a sex educator by trade. I'm still your community social worker. So whenever we bring a guest on to grief beyond death, we always ask, can you name a time that you were grieving, whether that is dealing with death and dying, or it doesn't have to deal with that, but just kind of a, a time that you grieved that stuck out to you, and how did you get through that? Hmm. Um, I think oftentimes when we think of grief, we often only think of grieving someone, when grief can also extend to grieving something. Uh, so, for me, I think moment was when I was not being which you know more about that, but it was just kind of the realization that that is not the best path for my life. So it definitely required me to take a step back and realize, well, what is the path for my life? Because that was something that I had held on to since I was five years old. I decided I wanted to be a lawyer. So we're talking a good 20 years of thinking that going to law school is eventually going to be where I ended up. Right. And when you have that realization that that is no longer what calls to you or like really inspires that passion in you, it is definitely something that can be a tough pill to follow. Uh, so the way that we worked through it was just having conversations. I mean, I talked to my therapist about it. I talked to my family and friends about it. And then I just really had conversations with myself about why I wanted to go to law school in the first place and why now I feel like it is not the best place for me to be, which is how I ended up going to school for marriage and family therapy and sexual therapy instead of law because that is more reflective of who I am and mm -hmm. I want to serve my community. But getting to that place definitely took some time. So I it, it increased my awareness in that sense. And it required me to be really honest with myself and not try to fulfill dreams that I, that seemed like other people had plotted for me mm. and kind of stayed on the course of. Right, right. No, that's good. I'm glad you brought that up because we haven't had a guest talk about um, actually like grieving 
something that wasn't a person or something that wasn't death. And I do get it because that's the culture we're taught, right? When you grieve, it has to be death. It has to be a person. Um, I think we even talk about divorce as far as grieving. But to actually say that you grieve like this dream, like I had this dream of being a lawyer. I had this dream of going because of everything that I've been through. And then so one day realized, man, that ain't even what I really want to do. Like, <laughs> So, and I think, you know, can you kind of walk us through, like, what did those conversations look like? Because obviously, if, like, if that's been a dream since you were five, I know you had some people that was like, what you mean? You not going to be a lawyer? Like, what are you talking about? Like, how did those conversations go? And what did it do to to your mind, body, and soul? I still do that. <laughs> um, I have, like, extended family members that always well, when are you going to be a lawyer? Or I have friends that I haven't seen in a while that do not know about my change of career that ask me that question. So I I decided I wanted to be a lawyer when I was like five. I had an uncle lawyer. Um, I found out later, not technically by education, because he didn't necessarily have the education for it. He was more self taught. Um, but he's very good. <laughs> but I. I would help him out doing his legal cases that he would do for people. And that, like, finding law codes that help you defend your client to the best of your ability was something that was just really fun for me. And right. it was also challenging because, I mean, I was a kid. <laughs> but as I got older, I definitely kind of say the course and I mean I developed other interests along the way but law was kind of always in the back of my mind as this is what I'm going to do right uh, so when I got to undergrad where I studied Asian languages and literature right uh with the focus on Chinese but that was more of the I was in middle school but I was still in law so a lot of people didn't know that, but I was still in pre I was in a pre law society. I took pre law classes. I was still planning to go to law school, um, even though I I would take some time off. I just did not know how long that time was going to be. So mm -hmm. I decided that I would work for the guy as a translator because I just spent four years learning, all that, right? So I use the best of my ability. So I ended up job offer which not a lot of people know you knew <laughs> but i got a job offer from the fbi um that i turned out because it was not after reflection on that i was like that's not the way that i want to go and i ended up coming home back home to st louis and i was little sister and we were just you know living life and i was like well law school i always tell myself i would do that right so now we're back to the plan that's why FBI. Yeah. You can rationalize them. <laughs> so that's why me, me going to the FBI didn't work out because I was supposed to be going to law school. God was blocking that so that I could be there. <laughs> like, I, love, I love that you just said that. <laughs> like, tell yourself. You're like, God blocked it because he knew I needed to be somewhere else. And lo and behold, I really did need to be somewhere else because I got really right. sick that summer. <laughs> and I needed to be at home. Right. So I took that year to really recover from that health issue. And I had to do a lot of stuff. Because I wanted to law. felt like I needed to serve my community in a different way. I needed, I felt pulled to help them in a different way. Right. So I researched the options and I was like, cool, I'll go to school for, I'll get my law degree and then I'll get a master's public health at the same time because it really uh, allowed me to my work on productive and sexual health rights and justice. So it would it would allow it would kill two birds with one stone. I can get this law degree that I've wanted since I was five. And, and I can also kind of find a different way to help people. Right. I ended up not getting accepted into the law program at SLU because for you to do that point degree they want you to focus on health administration and policy. Mm. Not what I applied to go for. I wanted to go for maternal and child health, global health. Um, so that was more of a conversation of just saying, mm, it's not what I want to do. So I turned down the law degree again <laughs> and continued with my master in public health. So I finished that. I 
started working at the organization that I work at now as a sexual health educator. And I've been doing that for the last three years. So about a year and a half, this urge to go back to school for something came back. Right. And I did not know what it was. I knew I wanted it to be something that would help to us change in my life. Specifically with African people of color. So naturally, because of the people that we serve in the organization, that I work for, we interact with predominantly people of color, specifically African Americans. It's majority African Americans that we serve. Um, so I saw the effects that the legal system had on the people that we serve, which African Americans make up a huge portion of people that are served by the legal system, but they do not have the knowledge of what the legal system is and how to right? So Okay, that's just kind of the validation that I needed that I need to go and get this law degree. Right. Again, rationalizing things. <laughs> so I started studying for the LSAT and I did it for seven or eight months or so. And then I was presented with an opportunity by my boss to essentially be kind of a therapist, a uh, kind of counselor, or a mentor more to a group of young girls at a middle school that we. And right. they have been dealing with violence. They have been dealing with some sexual health issues. They have also been with uh, traumatic experiences at home as well as bullying. Okay. So <laughs> I found out that I was going to be dealing with essentially a problem girl. <laughs> Whereas my other coworker was essentially going to get the girls that were more like the bullied girls. Um, so I spent seven weeks with them right so i'm not I, at this point i'm not even thinking about going to school to be a therapist or a counselor i really have no training on what that looks like outside of me going to therapy for right. so i have to insist of what i learned uh and even i mean kind of the social part of my job kind of leads into that counselor therapist role but not necessarily right so we i kind of built a curriculum specifically for girls and the issues that they were dealing with and that was rewarding i had ever in this position that i am in i teach that well all day <laughs> and i love it i really do but that was the most rewarding experience that I ever had with those girls because two of those girls that I was working with had already fought each other three times. Okay. The principal put them in this group because she literally had no other options. At this point, if they fight again, they gotta go. <laughs> like there's no there's no saving them at this point. Right. She's she better with try to talk to the family and sent them the alternative for um month or so um but she's like I, I don't have any other options for them i cannot continue to allow them to present this behavior in my school and let that be a representation to the other students that i serve right so like just see see what you do with them because I, I don't have so ended up just having honest conversations and at the beginning of it it was very clear that they did not like each other but they also made sure that they did not interact with each other. Mm. So they would always use <laughs> like this, this girl that I know, she does X, Y, and Z, or she the hub, or she she a thought. They would they would send all these subliminal messages to each other, which I never really I didn't know the background at the time. She had told that to my boss, and my boss did not inform me. Um, of that information. So I worked with them and we really worked on anger. We worked on some mental health issues. We worked on ways to control our emotions and it required them because a lot of the things that I gave them were more reflective assignments. It was more writing assignments and things that they really needed to figure out their emotions, right? So majority, actually, majority of the girls at that time had some type of at home. Whether that was parent, a parent that was in prison, a parent that was dead, that was being sexually like uh, they all had some type of experience that they were going through at home. Um and these two girls, one day their issue just kind of came to a head. <laughs> and 
I ended up really having to like play mediator for these two. And the issue that they ended up having was not, it wasn't as serious as they thought it was. If you can think back to when you were in middle school, you think about like had with people, that was what their issue was. So <laughs> it, we, we ended up talking about it and the sessions kind of left off with them still not really interacting with each other, not talking to uh, much. And then we went on winter break. So I got an email from the principal just like thanking me from all of the things that we did with the students and she hopes that we can continue this relationship. So come the next semester, I received another email that she wanted us back to school to work with a different set of kids. Cool. So we get back from the school. I'm working with the different set of kids kind of um, and we're just talking and she comes in to sit in on one of the sessions because unbeknownst to me she had a lot of positive reviews from the girls that were in the group with me before so they were just talking about that really helped them and she wanted to continue it because she was like i've not any of these girls say that and their behavior had changed when they came back from winter break the two girls that were always ready to fight each other they were actually friends right they talk to each other now they squashed all that beef and i was like oh, okay but she wanted to sit and just talk uh, See how the sessions and things go with them. And she was like, okay. So she ended up sending a very long email to my boss, just kind of like praising the work that myself and my coworker did because he was working with boys at the same time. Um, just the things that they were doing. So that was like the real moment where I was like, wow, like I could actually do this as a career. Now, I was still like, okay, but we're still going to pursue this law thing because I've wanted to be a lawyer since I was five. Right. <laughs> If this dream does not come to fruition, what has my life? Been? So I'm still sitting for the LSAT, um, but I'm just not like my heart is not really in it the way that it should be, and that when I do well on the LSAT, anything that I have attempted to do, and this is not really like a conceited thing, but anything that I've said I was going to do, I've always done it to the best of my ability. And I never did that test to the best of my ability in that moment because I just wasn't, I don't know. I was just kind of in a space where I was like, eh, I want to do it, but I don't, <laughs> but I do because I feel like I should be doing this. So I, I say when you were going through that, I hated like you in that season because you, you were, you just, you were forcing yourself. And I remember like, I remember people being like, no, she wants to do this. And I'm like, but she doesn't, though. She doesn't want to do this. Like, And at that point in my life, I was comfortable being like, I don't care what nobody say. Like, if I'm not doing it, I'm not doing it. And you was like, you was like, no, twin, I, I want to do this. I'm like, no, you don't. And I wasn't like, I, like some people told me I discouraged you. I wasn't discouraging you. You were just forcing yourself to do something that you didn't. Your heart wasn't there. And I know that because I've seen when your heart is there. So it was like she forced herself to do something. And then we had that late night conversation. And I was like, twin, like, look, like, it's just me and you here. Like, do you really want to be a lawyer or you just want to be a lawyer? Like, come on now. Like, let, let's be real because I felt the same way about teaching. Like, did I really want to be a teacher? Or I just wanted to be a teacher. Like, yeah, I remember that conversation. Yeah, I was like, do you actually want to be a teacher? <laughs> and you're like, yeah, I'm gonna be a teacher and I couldn't read. Come on now. And I, was like, I was like, but do you really like do you really want to do it? Like, of course, that's what I'm going to school for. I was like, okay. Like, but and I think with stuff like that, we've just uh, especially the school district you and I went to, they limited our career choices. It was teacher, rapper, athlete police officer like we never learned anything like i didn't even know a social worker was a real thing until i got to college so we you know i get to college and i learned there's a plethora of careers where you could still have these ideas and dreams you just don't have that lawyer status or the teacher status and people like you and i needed to know that because we over here trying to get these top name brand titles and we don't even want them <laughs> uh, I, I, I really and I remember having that conversation with a few people a few other people outside of you that was close to me and I was like I just don't think I'm in it like I am very passionate about 
health and reproductive rights. Which is why I do what I do because I love what I do. I love allowing students to have access to information regarding their health that they may not have been able to access before. Because for me, I feel like to make an informed decision, as we often tell teens that they need to do, well, we don't tell them that they need to inform, but we tell them that they need to make. But to make an informed decision, you need to have all the facts. Okay? Right. Um, so tell a teenager, especially majority of the hour, given the circumstances that they grow up in and the things that they see, that, oh, you shouldn't have sex because of this, or you shouldn't have sex because that's not for your age. It's not really, right? Or just giving them that constant rhetoric of you pregnant is not effective. Right. So <laughs> allowing them that space to really make that choice for themselves is what I love about what I do. And right. a lot of people have issues when they figure out what I do. Um, but at the end of the day, this I do this because I wish I had done it. And I was just about to say that I think the way you and I like I think people always knew you and I were gonna be successful. I think we always gave off those vibes. But when people meet us now and they realize we not living these lavish lifestyles, quote unquote, it's like some people question, like, what do you do? Like, you a sex therapist? Like, what does that even mean? Or like, you a community social worker? Like, that's so broad. And it's like, well, it is broad because there was so much in my life that was missing that I just needed one person to teach me or say, you don't even got to teach me, but just have a conversation with me. Like yeah. I could have saved so much money and time if I would have known that there were other career options other than teaching, because I had, I mean, I, you know, I talk about this a lot. I'm sure I had undiagnosed stuff going on and I'm over here trying to get to college and trying to get through. And I, I can barely read. I really, I can't comprehend nothing. Nothing makes sense. Everything in my head looks like it's jumbled together. Like, and it, it it's just like if somebody would have took the time before yep. I got to that campus and actually been like, Lisa, what is it that you want to do? Let's write it down. Let's put your vision on paper and let's look at our options because we we limit ourselves, but we limit ourselves because the people around us never taught us how to expand ourselves. So you don't know what you don't know until you know. True. And like, I, even just having more options than college, something. Yeah, absolutely. Our school district did not really provide. I mean, yeah, they tell you about like one type of academy or the I'm a firefighter. Cool. <laughs> but police academy is police academy was not something I was ever interested in. No, I'm in St. Louis. Heck no. Nah. Like, I support anybody that wants to do those things, but it just was. So we just don't present our youth with all the options that they have, nor do we present them with the option to take time off. So That's a big one. Before you spend thousands of dollars to realize that you just put three years in degree and you don't want to do it. Like, I mean, I use my bachelor's, but nobody, honey. No one. I mean, yeah, it's a great skill for me to have, and I definitely appreciate it because, you know, that is an expensive piece of paper that I worked very, very hard to acquire, but at the end of the day, like, I'm not saying it's useful because it's definitely allowed me to live in China on two separate occasions. It's definitely allowed me to meet different people that I would not have had a chance to meet, and it's positions in different places with different people that I would have had any but at the end of the day, if um, I wanted to make a career out of working in the sexual and reproductive health or if I would have known that I could have possibly found a way to bridge that with becoming a marriage and family therapist and sexual therapist, right? Because sexual therapy is sexual and reproductive health. Right. So if I would have figured out that I could do these things as a job, that could have saved me four years from getting that degree. Like I can still speak the language. I never really had to get a piece of paper to speak the language. I've been learning Chinese. Right. Since I was in the sixth grade. I didn't necessarily need to get that piece of paper to speak that language. 
Yeah. I know. I think I think that's a good conversation to have too because like even today I was talking to somebody and she's getting ready to go back to school and I referred to my degree as a piece of paper. She was like, Girl, that's your degree. I said, No, it's literally an expensive piece of paper. Like everything I'm doing, I literally did not need to go to grad school and spend hundreds thousand dollars on a piece of paper that is not even hung up in my room like it's literally under my bed somewhere and i i really only claim my degree when i need it and this isn't to discourage anybody from going to school this is just our reality like this was something that if we would have had options and had those real talks like things would have been so much more different and that's kind of why we're having this conversation today like kind of showing you like what we've been through led us to what we're doing because at the end of the day if i'm just being quite honest i never wanted a college degree and here i am sitting on two and i don't even claim them like people be so hyped like when i celebrated graduating grad school i didn't celebrate the degree i celebrated because i had my life back i was excited like <laughs> i no longer had to work for free i no longer had to do no homework i no longer had a long day like and, and I could focus on my health because what we don't talk about to our youth is school can damage our health as well. Mentally, physically, emotionally. Like at the prime of our life, we sit in a desk for eight hours. Yeah. Like, and we struggle with too much obesity. We struggle with too much depression, anxiety as a society that it's like we really don't take the time to really invest in our youth. And then we wonder why things are the way they are. Me... I don't I don't work with the youth only because there are more resources. I tend to work with high schoolers and college age people just because those are the people that like society tends to be like they grown, leave them be. And I just don't feel that way. Like I feel like we we still need to invest in them. Like if a 15 year old, we can still help them. A 25 year old, we can still help them. But and a lot of times I meet these older students that are like, I just needed somebody to listen. And just think, what if we just all just started listening? Yeah. If we all just started listening, like, how how much different would the world be? Yeah. And, like, I that, that statement is very real because that is something that I do with my students on a daily basis. It's just really allowing them the space to have those thoughts. <laughs> yeah that moment where they can truly express how they feel about something without the fear of being judged or ridiculed. Right. And a lot of them, like, even though it's not technically a part of what I teach, <laughs> I make sure that I build rapport and relationships with the students I work with in all the cases that is possible. Um, but because I want to show them that I am invested in more than just teaching them about sexual health. Right, because yes, sexual health is very important. It is very important to understand everything that goes in, not just, but also aspects of along with sexual activity, especially before you feel like you're ready. Right. So, I want to make sure that they know outside of that, I care about who you are. Exactly. So, when it comes to working with my students, like some of my things, if you, I just do check-in when my classes start. And it's just, how y'all doing? Like, before we really dive into this information, uh, especially if I know that that information is going to be a trigger, this is just time for me to let anybody know, because again, I don't ask for their personal history. Um, just to let them know that some of the information that we're going to talk about may trigger something in you, right? But it also is a way for them to say, ooh, you remember that test that I talked about that I was afraid I was going to fail? Yeah, I failed it. And it's like, okay, well, what are we going to do about it? Because F is not acceptable. I mean, unless you're okay with that. And it's like, why would I be okay with that, Miss Renisha? I was like, well, I mean, you seem like you accepted it, so I'm just asking. But you know what? <laughs> that was me. A F was fine to me, you know? So I, and I needed that space to be like, y'all really pressing me about some tests that it really don't mean nothing to me. Mm -hmm. And to have an adult say, like, like have an adult be like, well, why does it mean anything to you? And I could be able to say, because when am I ever going to use A plus B equals C? 
Like what? Like what? Does like I, I'm trying to I'm I'm trying to figure out how how I have food on the table tonight. Like what is this test gonna do? You know, and that's a lot of people like school. Just to me, school took away so much more than what we talk about. And so for a child like me, I really needed somebody like you and me to be like Lisa. Like like this don't got nothing to do with school. Mm-hmm. And it and it, and it and it didn't like. When we were taking those AP tests and we were taking ACT and I was failing and people like you so smart though, but I don't care about these tests. Mm-hmm. It don't matter how smart I am. If I don't care about that piece of paper, I just don't care about it. Yeah. yeah. And like that, those are the conversations that I have with my students because we have to, what we don't pay attention to with our students is that they have things that happen to them outside of the classroom. Exactly. And we do not acknowledge that you in a sense, do not acknowledge them. Exactly. Okay. Because what they're going through will determine what type of student they are. Exactly. And so yeah. I understand that. And I'm like, you, so you'll have a student that'll come in and they'll put their head down. I'm not going to force you to get up. I've never been that type of educator. I'm not, I'm not going to force you to get up because there may be a reason why you're doing it. Exactly. Right? So I went to a school district where a lot of the students that we had were put into adult situations, even though they were technically still children. We had students that were working two and three jobs to pay their parents' light bill, to make sure that their siblings could eat, to make sure that they still had a home to go to. So there may be a reason why that's their head down. They may have a child because let's be honest, a fair amount of them do. They may have multiple kids, and they not only do they have multiple kids, they are taking care of their siblings. Their parents might be incarcerated. They might have just watched one of their parents be incarcerated. Exactly. So we, as educators, we come in here, sometimes we take what students do so personally, well, really, it don't got nothing to do with us. And that's for me. Like, I didn't, you know, you you know my career history. I used to get cussed out all the time. And, and yes, I let those kids cuss me out. And other teachers would be like, why? I'm like, because they're not mad at me. But imagine I let them have their tantrum and then ask them, are you better now? And imagine they open up and I finally figure out what's causing that. I had a young man who couldn't read. He really couldn't read. And so he acted out in class. And so one day... I pulled him aside and said, what's what, you know, you don't like being here? Because if you don't like being here, I can unenroll you from the program. No, Miss Nolan, it's not that. I get embarrassed when y'all ask us to read out loud. Oh, so now I'm going to invite him to come sit down with me and we're going to have this conversation because now he just told me something. Yeah. Okay, so now he's been struggling with reading. So, yeah, in order for him not to be forced to read, he acts out. So it has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with a lack of respect, but it has everything to do with his self-esteem being so low because he doesn't know how to read, which as an educator, now that I know that, now I can provide him with the resources. Now I can actually go up to his school and talk to his team and say, this is what I found out this weekend. Because while y'all have him Monday through Friday, I have him on the weekends. So now I can partner with you guys and I can let y'all know that He's not being disrespectful. He's trying to figure out his place in school because he knows that him not being able to read is not acceptable in life. And he's trying to figure out if I don't even have the simple tools to read, how the heck I'm going to survive outside these classroom doors. But we as educators, some of us, we lack that. Not like we don't want to think that deep. We want the kids to come in sit down, be quiet for eight hours. Yeah. And that's just not realistic. And it's, it's detrimental to who they are as people, right? Because even as you are becoming, and even when you get into adult, when you work, that job, you have things that happen at that job that affects your ability to do your job. Right. So if we are understanding of that as adults, why don't we think teens go through the same thing? They live in homes with adults that deal with the same issues. A lot of the teens that I serve live in low socioeconomic areas, high crime areas. <laughs> right. They live in areas where 
I mean, granted, I grew up in the same area, so I get it. But they live in areas where they see unimaginable things on a daily basis. On a daily basis. But we have that mentality of a child needs to be in a child's place, but we're not giving them the oh. space to be in a child's space. No, no. They, they don't grow up in an environment where that is sustainable, nor can they survive. Because a lot of them survive. So I'm attempting to survive. It's very, very hard when I have to work two jobs, make sure my siblings eat, make sure the bill that we have. I mean, I know, but it go by. Now I'm going to school and y'all, but I can and cannot wear, who I can and cannot talk to, what time I have to be done with this, what assignment I have to turn in, when I didn't have time to do any of those assignments because I had to make sure that my little brother or sister got on the bus this morning or they had something to eat. And then y'all talk about me because my mama can't show up to the PTO meeting. Yeah. So what am I doing here? But right. what you don't know is my mama is an alcoholic. <laughs> That's what y'all don't know. What you don't know is daddy just got incarcerated last night and mama back to doing what she do best. Okay. Right. Like, and you just, and it's so, it's so crazy because I'm like, and I see it because I work in a lot of, in the area. So I see the teachers right like don't and the teacher is hard. hard it's very hard that's why i would never i would never be hard right and it can be really really taxed especially in certain school districts just because of the limitations of that school district so when you have teachers who do not make an connect with their students any real way and unfortunately a fair amount of students in the school district that I work in work with predominant African American children, but they are not African American themselves. Okay? So, which is not necessarily an issue, but when you don't take the time to recognize the things that your students are facing, how can you effectively teach them? How? And I had a conversation with a principal I was working, actually one that I was mentoring. But I had that conversation with her and I'm like, a lot of my students complain about this one teacher. What what goes on in this classroom? <laughs> All right, I, I would get it if it was just like one or two, but I see like a good 20 to 50 of your students. What's going on in the classroom? Why don't nobody like this teacher? <laughs> And she was like, I don't know. I was like, well, do you mind if I go sit in the classroom? Like, I just I just really need to understand. Because a lot of our check-ins was just really around that teacher stuff. Which, I mean, granted, they use more colorful language. But <laughs> it was really around how much that teacher sucked. So she told me to go sit in. And I, and I came back and she's like, well, what do you think the issue is? I was like, um, I think the issue is she doesn't really know how to work with our students and um that could just really be a lack of how to work with students that come from the environments that your students come from it could be a lack of care honestly like maybe she just really don't care <laughs> um i don't know i, I didn't ask her <laughs> i mostly just sat there and watched but she maybe she's given up maybe she cried before and it just wasn't received well uh, I don't really know but I think a conversation with her should be had about how you engage with these students because why you have a lot of because they use an electronic student like an electronic student app or mm -hmm. for all of their information just like tracking and things and a lot of the comments that she makes about students were just kind of just like negative comments like it just wasn't really it was like nitpicky type of things right uh, and i'm like i think it's just more she just doesn't know what to do with them so instead of really dealing with them, kind of just put them out like there was a kid who was a class clown and i worked with him which is why i went to my class i worked with him he was a class clown intelligent he's highly intelligent okay you give the boy any type of work he can have it done 15 to 20 minutes after you gave it to him. Right. Okay. Now, what you don't know is with the stuff that he deals with at home. Right. Which was real issues. Okay. Like, 
real issues that just kind of bleed over into his behavior at school because he has no outlet. You all come here and force him to be a child, but at home he has to be an adult because by and weakness is not accepted in his household. So when he come here and you say something about his behavior, he steps up to you like he's a grown ass man. He's all of 12. But you wanna know why? Because last night, his mom's boyfriend stepped up to him like he was a grown ass. Mm -hmm. So those bruises that y'all seeing were not from him playing with his friends outside. But that's what he told you. So it was just, it's just so unfortunate because a lot of the teachers that are in these schools, they're underpaid, they're overworked, they're tired. They work in school districts that don't really support them. <laughs> they work in school districts that don't really have the resources to support them. <laughs> and it's just kind of like a trickle down effect, which leads to them not as effective classroom because they can't get what they need and they have a school district that is into them in a way that fills them up enough so that they have enough overflow to pour it into their students. Right. Right. It's, yeah. Yeah. So, basically for today, <laughs> <laughs> basically, honestly, everything she said was so true. And it does have a lot to do with grief because when you think of our students, when you think of our adults, we're always grieving something, whether there is missing somebody, but maybe it's that dream. Maybe it's that home. You know, when we think about our kids, if our kids are now homeless, they're probably grieving the house they grew up in. That was something that I, to this day, as an adult, I struggle with. Like, I grieve the house I grew up in and I grieve having a home. Like, I feel like ever since we lost our home, I haven't been able to find a home. So when we look at stuff like this, we really just got to keep in mind, like everything that we see on the front isn't what it is. And when we're working with kids and we're working with people in the community and we're working with just people in general, we have to learn to just be quiet and let people say and do what they need to do. Because at the end of the day, we don't know people's stories. So um, we will have a part two. We both actually have a podcast called Side Note. Um, episodes are released every Saturday. So Healing She Got Faith is, re is released every Sunday. Side Note is released every Saturday. So we will come back. We will do a part two. Where we kind of are going to give you guys a snippet, like a live visual of how we record which is going to be interesting because because healing she got faith is very much serious and side note is very much goofy so <laughs> we'll try to be yeah <laughs> so we're definitely gonna reach out um y'all know every sunday this is the place to be we are hitting our self-love journeys we're hitting our grief we are learning about ourselves. You know, I'm always telling you guys, I love you guys. I love you the way you love the rest of the world. I cannot wait to see you next week. Don't forget to check out the blog and just check out um, the website. We got some cool things on there. So just make sure, you know, you listen and you check out and love yourself the way you love the world. So thank you, twin, for coming and being our guest. We cannot wait for part two. We'll catch everybody next Sunday.